Hi everybody, this is a review of Science Chapter 8. So what I would like you to do right now is take out your science textbook and I would like you to turn to page 194. Science textbook, page 194. We are going to do a review online today because tomorrow is your open book test. So as we do the review, I would like you to be following along in your book. To do the review, we are going to use a PowerPoint. And uh, give me one second to make sure that you can see it. Okay, I think everybody can see it, that's good. All right, so we're gonna start with the title, which is Changes in an Ecosystem. And on page 194, our first vocabulary word was a regular pattern of change used by God to maintain the earth. Now, you should be able to tell me that answer and the answer is a cycle. There are many cycles. The picture on this page is just showing you the water cycle. Okay, the next one is very easy. It's the regular divisions of the year. And it, uh, these divisions bring temperature and precipitation changes. And of course, you know that these are the seasons. Very easy. But, not every place on earth experiences the four seasons like we do. We learned about the biomes in the past, and we know that not every biome on earth has four seasons. So the next thing that is talked about in your book, and this is on the next page, page 195, is the monsoons. Now, monsoons are winds that change direction with the seasons. And I'm going to show you um, some maps to just give you a little bit of an idea. Monsoons only occur in the biomes that only have a wet and a dry season. So this picture is a picture of the southwestern United States. And this is a picture of precipitation during a monsoon season. This will be a precipitation map. So when you look at all of these colors, you will see during monsoon season, they are getting many inches of rain, some places up to 12 to 16 inches of rain in a month. And remember, those monsoon winds bring in the moisture and you get heavy rains and then the winds change direction. They go back out to sea and then the region experiences a very dry time. So part of the United States does get monsoons, as you can see. The next precipitation map I'm going to show you is actually of Southeast Asia, which was also mentioned in your book. And this is during monsoon season. And this is talking about how many millimeters a month of rain these areas are getting. So you can see some areas on the coast are getting really high up to 600 millimeters a month of rain. So during the wet season, the monsoon winds pull all the moisture from the ocean onto the land and cause heavy rains. Then the winds change direction and blow back out to sea, and then this land would experience a dry season. Okay, now you're going to go to the next page in your book, which is page 196. And we start talking about the carbon cycle. But before we talk about the carbon cycle, we're gonna do a little review of something I'm sure you learned when you were in younger grades in science, photosynthesis. This is the process by which plants make food. They use water and carbon dioxide and energy from the sun. And as the process of photosynthesis occurs, they create sugar molecules and oxygen. The oxygen is released through the stomata, those little holes in the leaves, and it goes out into the air. 
The sugar molecules are used to help the plant grow and the rest of them are stored in the plant, mostly in the stem. Because remember, consumers rely on these plants, which are producers for food. So when the consumer eats the plant, that stored sugar is the energy that the consumer gets. Here's just a little chart about photosynthesis, just because sometimes it's easier when you see a picture than just words. So photosynthesis, you've got the sunlight. The sunlight hits the plant. The plant creates the food using the carbon dioxide and the water. It gives off oxygen and it converts the sugar, puts those sugars in its stem. It's converted into a starch. And this is the process of photosynthesis. Now, photosynthesis is also part of the carbon cycle. Another part of the carbon cycle is respiration. And this was probably a little bit difficult to understand because it was probably new. So one easy thing to remember is that photosynthesis and respiration are the exact opposite of each other. So respiration is when an organism uses sugar molecules and oxygen and turns it into energy. Okay, reminder, every living thing needs carbon and every living thing is made of carbon. You are made of carbon. I am made of carbon. Plants and animals are made of carbon. And this carbon is part of a cycle. This is a cycle that God created and it continues and continues and continues and happens over and over and over again. So this is the picture that was in your book. So we'll talk about this a little bit. Okay, in the carbon cycle, the sun provides the energy for the plants to make food. The plants take in carbon dioxide and they release the energy. When the animals eat the plants, they get carbon from the plant. When animals, when animals perform respiration, they take in oxygen and they are releasing carbon dioxide. Now, the gross thing that I'm sure you will laugh hysterically at if we were in school, is that animals release their waste into the soil and that releases carbon dioxide into the air as well. The decomposers, the bacteria and the fungi, break down the waste and the bodies of dead things. And as they break things down, carbon dioxide is released back into the air again and this happens over and over and over again and this is what we call the carbon cycle the decomposers break down the bodies of dead things and then they release carbon dioxide into the air bacteria insects mushrooms and worms are four examples of decomposers all right, a couple of questions. I want you to answer them, answer them at home while you're watching the video. What is a cycle? Hmm. Okay, hopefully said it's a regular pattern of change. What is the name of winds that change direction with the seasons? Hey, okay, those are monsoon winds. All right, fill in this blank. Photosynthesis and respiration are the blank of each other. Okay, answer is they are the opposite of each other. All right, now we are going to continue with the nitrogen cycle and you are going to turn to page 198 in your book. One of the most important things you need to know about nitrogen is right here. To be usable, nitrogen gas must blank with other elements first to form compounds that plants, animals, and humans can use. Okay, hopefully you know that the word that goes in the blank is combine. 
If you remember some of the videos we watched for the nitrogen cycle, the nitrogen in the air cannot be used by the plants and animals and humans in the form that it is. Nitrogen gas, we can't use it in that form. It has to be combined with other elements first, and then we can use it. That's the most important thing to know about the nitrogen cycle. Okay, next question. What can change nitrogen really fast into a usable form? It can only change a little tiny bit at a time, but it does it super fast. Okay, lightning. Lightning can take nitrogen and turn it into a usable form, but only very small amounts at a time. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the more traditional way that nitrogen um, becomes usable. And this question is, what lives inside the root nodules, those little tiny bumps on the roots of plants? What is in those little bumps? And there's a picture. You can see the nodules, little bumps. Okay, hopefully you remembered that bacteria are inside of those nodules. And that bacteria changes the nitrogen into a usable form. And here is our picture of the nitrogen cycle. Okay, nitrogen is in the air. If you remember when we learned about the atmosphere and the percentages, we learned that 78% of our air is nitrogen. So we know that there is a lot of nitrogen available in the air, but humans cannot use the nitrogen. Plants and animals can't use it the way it is. So the nodules, the root nodules in the roots of plants help the nitrogen to combine with other elements. And then the nitrogen that has been changed goes up into the roots of the plants and the plants can use it now. Then we have Mr. Bunny Rabbit here. Then the animals eat the plants and they get nitrogen. And then you might have broccoli for dinner and you eat your broccoli and you get nitrogen. Um, the bacteria also releases a little bit of the nitrogen back into the air. And then that good old bacteria breaks down waste and plant remains and returns the nitrogen compounds back into the soil again. Just like the water cycle and the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle continues over and over and over and over again. It is a cycle designed by God and it continues over and over again, a cycle, a regular pattern of change. Okay, this one should be super, super, super familiar. And this would be on page 200. And I think we talked about this earlier this year, and I know you've talked about it in the past because when we talked about it, you knew about it. So this is a good old water cycle. Evaporation, condensation, precipitation, groundwater, which is an important part of the water cycle because some of the water is stored below the ground for the plants to use later. And then transpiration, when the plants release water vapor into the air. Okay, now a little excitement. Get ready for a reminder of the good old days when we actually were in school. And hopefully this will remind you a little bit of what it was like when we were actually in school. The water cycle takes the water and moves it up and down and all around the earth. The water cycle takes the water and moves it up and down and
ocean takes over, it goes up to the clouds, water vapor cools down, down. and it changes to a liquid now. Precipitation happens when the drops get big. It falls like rain, snow, sleet, and hail upon my head. I know, I know. it's the water cycle happening again. Whoa, whoa. Evaporation, condensation, precipitation. The water cycle. Okay, well, that was just a little memory of when we were in school and we could watch videos together and laugh and think they were funny. And that was always a fun video. All right, back to work. Okay, more information about the water cycle. When liquid water changes into a gas, we call that evaporation. When plants release water into the air through their stomata, that is known as transpiration. You can see that occurring in the picture. When water vapor changes back into a liquid, we call that condensation. That is also what you feel on the outside of your glass when your glass feels wet. That means that the water and the vapor in the air has cooled down so much because of the ice in your glass that it's turned back into a liquid again. Then condensation that falls back to the earth is precipitation. Then we have groundwater. Groundwater soaks into the ground and it stays there and it is used later by plants and by animals. All right, a couple of questions. How is most nitrogen changed into usable compounds? Okay, remember, that would be the root nodules and the bacteria changing the nitrogen into a usable form. What can be found in the root nodules of plants? What's in those little nodules? It is bacteria. Why is this important? Without the bacteria, the nitrogen cannot be changed into a usable form, so it's essential. All right, now let's go to the next section in our textbook, and that is gonna be on page 204. So now we're talking about stresses on an ecosystem. A stress, any physical hazard to life caused by having too much or too little of the things needed for life. Examples of stress on an ecosystem, fire, flood, and drought. So we start with fire. The primary causes of fi forest fires, why they usually start is people's carelessness. People don't put out their fires when they're camping. Most of the time, that's how the fires start. Fires can also be started by lightning, especially when it's a very dry season or there has been a drought. Even though forest fires can be harmful and dangerous, there's also benefits to a fire. Some of the benefits that we read about were, the fire gets rid of all the dead trees, the dead branches, and other things that could cause a larger fire later on. The fire causes nutrients from the dead trees and plants to get recycled back into the soil. And there are some plants that have seeds that will only sprout after a fire. Okay, and here is just an example of a forest fire. The next one is a flood. This occurs when an ecosystem receives more water than it can use or store. Floods can be harmful or even disastrous. But sometimes floods can be beneficial 
because they move and distribute fertile soil and seeds in new areas. Here is just a picture of a flood and you can see that the flood is so powerful that it's breaking up the road. That gives you a little bit of an idea of how powerful those floodwaters actually are. The third one is a drought. A drought occurs when an ecosystem receives less rainfall than it needs and it causes a lot of problems in an ecosystem. And a drought is different from other stresses because it doesn't have a beginning, a definite beginning, or a definite ending. Here is an example of a land that has been, infect been affected by a drought. Okay, now I would like you to make sure that you have turned to page 207 in your science textbook. Now we're going to talk about succession. Succession is a gradual change in the population of organisms in an ecosystem. It's caused by a change in part of the environment. I have a picture, a really basic picture, but it helps you to see. Here is an ecosystem. Oh no, forest fire. Fire, when the fire is over, nothing left. Succession is when things slowly, slowly start to grow back over time. And sometimes the things that are in the ecosystem after succession might not be exactly the same as they were before. A succession is a gradual change after a stress occurs, gradually the ecosystem will come back again and it might be different than before. All right, a couple of questions. Describe what a stress to an ecosystem is. Okay, a stress, too much of something or too little of something needed for life. How can floods be beneficial? They cause a lot of damage, but they do move soil and seeds to different areas where they may not have been able to go before. What is succession? Gradual change in an ecosystem over time. After a stress might have destroyed some or most of that ecosystem, eventually over time things start to grow and come back, but it might not look exactly the same as it did before that stress destroyed the original ecosystem. Okay, ecosystems and man. We are responsible to take care of God's creation. When God created Adam and Eve, he told them to take care of the earth. And this is still our responsibility today. Each of us has a personal responsibility to take care of God's creation. Uh, there are certain man-made stresses that harm our environment. The biggest one is is habitat destruction. When humans destroy a complete habitat or a complete ecosystem. Pollution, we all know about pollution. This is a man-made stress. The third one, excessive hunting and fishing, taking too much out of the ecosystem and it doesn't have a chance to replenish itself. Okay, just a picture to give you a better idea of habitat destruction, it's always good to see pictures to help you understand. So this is an area where the, all the trees have been cut down. They are all gone. And this is an example of habitat destruction. We talked about ways to make the impact of habitat destruction less. And we talked about the fact that we could uh, if you cut down a tree, make sure that you plant another tree. That's one way to help with habitat destruction. And we also need to be careful that we are not cutting down and destroying all of the habitat. We need to leave the trees and the plants. We need to leave some of that there. You can't just cut through and destroy everything. Then we have pollution. And I have um, water pollution air pollution. Okay. The easiest thing that we can do to help with this kind of pollution is we uh, put our trash in the trash can. Sounds obvious, but when you go out places, you see that a lot of people 
just drop their trash on the ground. They don't put it in the trash can. Also, if something is recyclable, you should always put it in recycling. If you see trash when you're out, pick it up and throw it away. Because eventually all of the trash ends up getting into our water systems. Okay? We talked a little bit about air pollution and pollution that companies create. And we talked a little bit in class about how this is a problem because the people that run the companies make products that we need and they need their jobs. However, it also causes destruction to the environment. And we talked about what could we do about that? How could we change that? And people are still uh, working on that. People are still wrestling with that, trying to figure out ways to cut down on pollution while still creating the products that we need. The next one is excessive hunting and fishing, taking too much out of the ecosystem. And in our country, there are lots of rules. If you have somebody in your family that's a hunter or a fisherman, I don't know a lot about it, but I do know that there are certain seasons where you can hunt for certain animals and there's certain fish that you're not allowed to take out of the water or you're only allowed to take out a certain number or you can get in trouble and get fined. So we have to leave enough in our waters and in our forests so that the ecosystem can replenish itself. Okay, plants and animal species that originally live in an ecosystem are called native species. They belong there. And here are just some native species. I thought this was interesting that all of these bat species are native to Maryland. So I don't particularly like bats, but all of these different kind of bats are native to Maryland. Then we have other mammals over here. Lots of these mammals are native to Maryland. So we see some very familiar ones like the porcupine, there's the white-footed mouse, we see the raccoon, there's a skunk. So we see a lot of these animals. There's the fox squirrel with the long bushy tail. We've seen a lot of these animals around us. These are all native species. Then we have the invasive species. Species that are not native to an area, they're brought in. But sometimes these invasive species can cause a lot of problems, they can cause harm. This is an example of one invasive species, and this was actually put out by University of Maryland, just warning farmers. This is the spotted lanternfly. The spotted lanternfly, this is what it looks like when it's a nymph, when it's young. This is what it looks like when it is full grown. It shows you some of the destruction that the spotted lanternfly can cause. And it tells farmers what to look for. It tells the impact. It seriously impacts grapes, orchards, and the logging industry because it destroys trees. Then it gives some management strategies. What do we do about this invasive species? So there are many invasive species. This is just one example. Okay, extinct, and you see the dinosaur. If uh, an animal is extinct, if a species is extinct, that means no living members are left, and we know that the dinosaurs are extinct. Then we have the endangered species. This is a species where the population that's left on the earth is so small that it is in danger of becoming extinct. And some of these are animals that we know and love and that we're familiar with. Elephants, panda bears, snow leopards, the bison, the gorilla. A lot of these animals, there's not that many left of them. So we need to protect the ones that are left. Then we have the threatened species. The species that they're not endangered yet, but if nothing is done, they could become endangered in the near future. And this is a picture of threatened species. Again, you see the Asian elephant is on there. There's camel, zebra, orangutan. A lot of these animals that are very familiar that we've known about since we were little kids and that we love to read about and see pictures of well a lot of these animals are threatened and there are many scientists that are working hard to figure out how to save these animals and increase their populations again 
Okay, what are two ways that people can lessen the harm done to an ecosystem during development? And we talked about this a little bit. We talked about, let me get to my page. We talked about the fact that we can plant trees so that there's not as much, um, we're not just cutting so much down and we're not putting anything back. We talked about, um, in the book, there's an example of something called a fish ladder. They build it around a dam so the fish have a way to go around the dam and keep swimming. Um, there's all kinds of things that we can do to protect our ecosystems. We can also make sure that we do not pollute and that we are careful. And if we see trash, we throw it away. Why would a species be considered invasive? A species would be invasive if it is not native to our environment. And then when it comes into our environment, it causes harm. A lot of times when an invasive species brought in, it doesn't have a natural predator. So it just keeps reproducing and reproducing and reproducing and causing more and more damage. How is an extinct species, dif species different from an endangered species? It's a pretty easy question. Extinct species, there's no more left. Endangered, there's a small amount left and we have to um, be really careful and help these animals to survive. Okay, that was a review of chapter eight. And here is the assignment. You're gonna use your book. You can go back and refer to this video again as much as you need to, to complete science activity manual, page 143. If you want to write the answers in the book, you can, or you can just go right into the LMS quiz and put the answers right in. All of those questions have been put into the LMS quiz. Now, tomorrow and Wednesday, you will have two days to complete your science chapter eight open book test. Now, remember, just because it's an open book test does not mean automatically you're going to get everything right. You still need to know where things are. Make sure that all of those terms are highlighted. Whenever you see a word that is italics or a word that is bold, highlight the definition so that you know how to find things easily. And so we're going to do this review today. The test will be Tuesday and Wednesday, and then we will start our next chapter, which will be chapter nine. Okay, that is all for today. I'll see you next time.